Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in today's presentation we are going to be looking at evolution, the theory and its supporting evidence. So I'm sure you understand this is quite a large topic so it's going to be split over two presentations. This first one's a little bit on the larger side and the second one is going to be shorter. Okay, let's get going. So if we're going to talk about evolution we need to start with HMS Beagle. So HMS Beagle was a British sailing ship and it was about to go on its second voyage and this voyage was to circumnavigate the earth and whilst doing that they were supposed to spend some time mapping the coastline of southern and western South America. So the captain, Fitzroy, uh, the captain called Robert Fitzroy was a worried man. So unfortunately during the first voyage which was also a circumnavigation the captain had gone and killed himself due to the stress of the job and he, you know, that left Fitzroy in an unexpected command. Fitzroy was also worried because his uncle had committed suicide and so he felt that suicide may be in his blood. So the problem Fitzroy had was that as the captain, you know, being the superior officer and a gentleman, he was supposed to avoid forming relationships with his crew and junior officers because it's lonely at the top. So this would have meant that he was facing about four years and nine months of talking to the ship's surgeon or himself. So he decided that what he really needed was a gentleman companion to help keep him entertained. So it's debated whether Fitzroy wanted a companion purely to talk to or whether he wanted an additional educated person to help spread the workload. One of the other things that you have to bear in mind is that the captain and the ship surgeon were responsible for collecting materials as they went along. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, it would have been uh, Fitzroy's job, along with the surgeon, Robert McCormack, to have collected rock samples, plant samples, animal samples. They would have had to catalogue this material and store it safely to be returned to the United Kingdom for study. So obviously this is a lot of work, and so it wouldn't be surprising if Fitzroy also wanted an additional educated person on board to help you know, reduce some of that workload. So regardless of the exact reason, Charles Darwin was hired as the ship's geologist, although interestingly he wasn't actually hired by the Royal Navy, so it meant he had to pay his own way on the ship, so he had to go and ask his dad for money to help fund his place. Also, uh, he nearly didn't get the position because Captain Fitzroy was a follower of the, of the study of physiognomy, which is using someone's facial features to uh, predict their personality. And so Fitzroy was worried that, uh, based on his facial features, Darwin had a deceitful personality. But even so, he decided to take Darwin along. So Darwin's presence did not go down well with some people. The ship's surgeon, who was called Robert McCormack, was the official naturalist, so he was supposed to be in charge of collecting you know, rock samples, plant samples, etc. But Darwin kept doing his work, so this unfortunately annoyed McCormack no end, so he got in a strop and he took the first ship available back to the UK, and the new surgeon had to be sent along to replace him. So Fitzroy and Darwin initially got on quite well, However, on one occasion, the topic of slavery came up. Fitzroy was pro-slavery, Darwin was against slavery, and the two of them had an absolutely massive argument, and this argument resulted in them not talking to each other for about two years, so approximately half the length of the voyage. So, uh, whilst on the ship, Darwin collected samples all along the east and west coasts of South America. However, one stop proved by far and away the most important, this is the stop we're all familiar with. So on the 15th of September 1835, HMS Beagle reached the Galapagos Islands off the west coast of Ecuador. So while there, Darwin collected samples and made observations about the bird species in particular. And so what these observations did is they changed his view on the fixity of species. So the fixity of species was the, you know, the preferred idea at the time, and it said all life, or sorry, all species were created in their original form and that since their creation, little or no change had occurred. So essentially it's a biblical view of creation. Life is created, and it was you know, perfectly designed for its environment, and as such, it doesn't adapt. So the Galapagos Islands themselves are a group of volcanic islands, and the volcanism is related to a hotspot, so in terms of what's going on, it's very similar to Hawaii. The central and western islands are volcanically active and the volcanoes are pumping out mafic lava, so producing basalt. So you can see we have a, a, a satellite image of one of the islands here and you can quite clearly see the, the dark brown lava flows on the surface there. Volcanism began around 20 million years ago, although it could have started before that, we're not 100% sure. 
and we can see the islands are moving off to the east and the older islands are actually underwater so you can't see them anymore they've been eroded down until they're below sea level but these younger islands here are obviously above sea level so you can go and them you know go visit them and look at the the life on them so what did Darwin actually find? So before reviewing his evidence, it's important to note a few things. Number one, Darwin was reading theology at Cambridge University. Now, this was because he had actually gone and flunked out of his second year at Edinburgh Medical School. So his father decided he had to find a job for his son. And so he thought, right, I'll send him to Cambridge so he can get a BA. And this would allow Darwin to become a vicar. The only other real option for a gentleman's son at that time would have been to join the military. So Darwin was actually well on his way to taking holy orders and becoming a clergyman. So up until sailing on the Beagle, Darwin also held that the fixity of species was you know, a, a valid idea. However, during the voyage, he made several observations that began to change his thinking. So he collected llama, sloth and armadillo fossils as they were working their way along the coastline of South America. And what he spotted was that these fossils resembled the present-day llamas, sloths, and armadillos of South America. However, he also noticed that there were subtle differences. He also noticed that these fossils occurred in layers with extinct animals, so animals that were no longer around. At the Galapagos Islands, when looking at the bird species, he went and postulated that the 13 species of finch that live on the Galapagos Islands and the one species that live on Cocos Island, which is to the north of the Galapagos Islands, he came to the conclusion that they all had a common ancestor from which they evolved. He suggested that this common ancestor resembled a blue-backed grassquit finch, which is a very common bird along South America's west coast, and there's a picture of one right here. Now, this was actually an educated guess on the part of Darwin, but he's actually correct. This is the, you know, the ancestor species for these uh, finches on the Galapagos Islands. So he also went and noted that the finch's physical characteristics, especially beak shape, was changing due to the scarcity or prevalence of certain foods on certain islands. So his, you know, so his observation was that the animal was adapting in order to allow it to exploit different food sources depending on what was available. So here is a, uh, a representation of the finch, uh, finch family tree for the Galapagos Islands. And you'll notice, first of all, that there is a lot of variation in terms of head size and beak size and shape. So the first thing you'll notice is the larger the beak, the bigger the head. And this makes reasonable sense. Obviously, the bigger your beak is, the bigger the muscles have to be to actually allow you to use the beak. And obviously, the bigger the muscles are, the bigger the mounting points have to be for those muscles. So you've got to have a larger head and you've got to have a larger spinal column. And so obviously, bigger the beak, the bigger the bird has to become. So what Darwin noticed is that depending on what the animal was trying to eat, it would affect the size and shape of the bird. So if we look at the seed eaters, for instance, here, we have four varieties of seed eater. Well, the large ground finch is living in an environment where the seeds which are available to it are big and they have very, very hard shells. And so the large ground finch has evolved a very, very large, powerful beak to allow it to actually break into these seeds and extract the good stuff inside. In contrast, the small ground finch is dealing with an environment where the seeds are quite small and they're quite easy to break into. And so the beak doesn't need to be anywhere near as well developed. And so you'll notice that depending on how hard the seed is they're trying to get into, the bird gets larger. So difficult, hard seeds for large ground finches and small ground finches are dealing with quite small, quite easily uh, broken up seed material. We also have the cactus eaters. So the first thing you'll notice about the cactus eaters is that the beaks are actually quite long and pointy. Compare that to the ground finches where the, the uh, well, should I say the seed-eating finches, where the beaks are actually a little bit stumpier, but a little bit, you know, tougher looking, a little bit, little bit more well built. So the cactus eaters, while well, they're trying to get to the soft, water-rich inner parts of the cactus. And so depending on how thick the, the hide of the cactus is, that's obviously going to, you know, limit how easy or difficult it is to get into the centre of the cactus. And so you'll notice that both of these birds have these elongate beaks. That's designed to allow them to use the beak to puncher into the cactus, so to get through that thick hide. 
but you'll notice that we have two different varieties and the large cactus finch is trying to deal with cacti that have you know, much thicker skins and so once again the bird needs to develop a much larger more powerful beak to allow it to actually penetrate the skin and get to the water rich material inside. On the other side of the tree we have the berry eaters and the insect eaters. So we're not really going to worry about the berry eaters very much. They don't really have any particularly special adaptions. They're just eating berries off plants. So what about the insect eating finches? So you can see that's all of these birds here. So once again, depending on what they are trying to eat and how they're trying to get it, the beak shape changes slightly. So for instance, we have the small and the large insectivorous finch. finch sorry. <clears throat> And these birds are trying to exploit uh, insects of different sizes and of different you know, levels of protection. So the large, fin large insect of a finch is trying to deal with insects which are larger, better armed, and as such, once again, the bird needs to have a more robust beak to allow it to deal with them. Then we have some, uh, some of the more specialist uh, birds. So we have the mangrove finch. So the mangrove finch, as you can see, has developed this very elongate, narrow beak. And that's because it's dealing with an environment where it's trying to get its beak either into small holes or behind the bark to actually get to insects living in um, mangrove-rich environments. So as you can see, it's got a slight adaption. And then we have the tool using finch. It has the same kind of uh, beak design, but it's a bit larger. The reason it's a bit on the larger side is because the tool using finch, as the name suggests, has developed the ability to use tools. So it will use branches and uh, bits of reed, which it will then bend to form hooks, which it will then put into holes and then pull insects out of the hole using the hooks that it makes. Now, obviously, you know, pulling an insect out of a hole, the insect's not going to go easily, so the tool using finch has to be built a little bit more robustly to allow it to actually have the, you know, the, the power to remove the insect from its, from its hiding place. So Darwin spotted these changes and he managed to relate them to the different food sources that the animals were trying to exploit. And so he noticed this. And so what he came to the, what he did is essentially he came to the conclusions that organisms were descended with modifications. So an organism will change over time to suit its environment. He also came to the conclusion that all of these finches had a common ancestor from which they descended. And these are the cornerstones of the theory of evolution. So why do we actually study evolution? Well, evolution is fundamental to both biology and paleontology. So it helps to explain how inheritable changes in organisms occur through time. So remember, an inheritable change is something that you can pass on to your offspring. So paleontology is, of course, the study of life uh, as revealed by fossils. So evolution, like plate tectonics, is a unifying theory. It helps to explain a group of disparate facts and observations and bring them together under one uh, umbrella process. It also gives us a framework in which we can discuss life history, because once you, you know, begin to appreciate and once you come to the conclusion that evolution is taking place, well, then all of a sudden you can look at the fossil record and it starts to make a lot more sense. It starts to really help you to explain what's going on. So there are a couple of quick, quick points we need to bear in mind. Number one, evolution does not explain the origin of life. So this remains one of the big questions in science. We have some good theories which might help us to explain, you know, the, the beginning of life, you know, but things like how amino acids, proteins, fats, etc. managed to form the first primitive organisms is still actually rather uncertain. It's a very complicated process. However, once you actually have this first primitive organism, evolution will kick in, come into effect, and it will begin to change the organism over time. So what does evolution actually mean? So it's the process by which an organism, by which an organism or organisms have changed since life began, and it works on both small and large scales. So a small, a small scale change would be something like in the genetic makeup of a population. So it's something localized. It's typically, you know, uh, limited to just one species. Large scale changes, however, uh, can, uh, are things like the origin of an entirely new species from a common ancestor. So it's essentially a major change. So an organism has, has adapted itself so much from the original ancestor species that it can now be considered a distinct organism in its own right. 
and both of these are examples of biological evolution. So, obviously, was Darwin the first? Well, you know, actually people have been thinking about the, the problem of the evolution of life for actually quite a long time. So some of the Greek philosophers had begun to, you know, whilst looking at rocks, and they began to think, well, maybe, you know, maybe animals do actually change over time. Now, then there were also European philosophers and theologians during the Middle Ages. So we have St. Augustine of Hippo, and he postulated that God created the universe as a nebulous matter in which lay the primal seeds. So what uh, his idea was is he was saying that he was taking a biblical view, but he was saying that life essentially isn't you know, uh, predetermined. The possibility of an organism to suit a certain environment is there. Think the conditions just need to be met for that organism to flourish. So he was essentially saying that every organism is adapted to its environment and the organisms will occur as the, you know, as the need for them appears. And then we also have uh, Islamic scientists. Now, uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce these names because I will say them terribly wrong. Okay, so I'm not even going to go there. But uh, these uh, Islamic uh, writers and scientists essentially postulated that we had an evolution from mineral to plant, from plant to animal, and from animal to man. And in fact, you know, these, these theories were so radical that it actually led to some of these uh, writers and scientists actually being expelled from major cities for their support of this idea. However, in Europe, the dominant belief up until the 19th century was that Aristotle was correct and that animals were created as they were and that little or no change had occurred. This, of course, means the first two books of Genesis contained all the information you needed to know about the formation of the Earth and its organisms. However, there were some groups that espoused uh, multiple creation theories. But, of course, the most important thing you have to bear in mind is that obviously going against church dogma was considered heresy, and, of course, that could actually have some pretty serious repercussions for you. Everything from being put under house arrest all the way through to more extreme punishment, shall we say. So you had to be very, very careful, and this led a lot of people uh, in Western Europe to essentially um, not put forward their ideas for the evolution of life. So all of this began to change during the 18th century when the Enlightenment began. And this was given an extra kick by the French Revolution in the late 18th century, and this produced the first European state in which the church and the government were separate entities. So before then, the church and the government would be operating essentially as one uh, entity. However, once the French Revolution took place, you had the government, and the government was separate from the church, and this meant the government could do what it wanted, including doing things like funding scientific institutions in which the scientists would be allowed to you know, undertake scientific studies that they saw fit without being overseen by the church. So naturalists began to discover evidence that couldn't easily be reconciled with a literal interpretation of the Bible. So an example of this would be something like it became clear that the large thicknesses of sedimentary rock were not the result of a great flood. So scientists began to realise that, you know, the, 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 the sheer thickness of the sedimentary sequence that was present would require an extremely long time to form. So, you know, saying that it was all due to one large flood event just didn't really work. They also noted that some animals had died out, so some animals had clearly existed in the past, but these animals had not all died out at the same time. So if you were making the argument these animals had been killed by some kind of great flood event, well then you would expect them to have all died at the same time, and you would expect them to all you know, die out in the same layer of rock, but this isn't the case. There were animals that were appearing and disappearing throughout the entire sequence. So those naturalists focused on geology began to prove that number one, the principle un uh, began to uh, prove the principle uniformitarianism. If it's happening now, it's happened in the past. Well, at the time they would say at the same rate, although we now know that rates change over time. And they also became also came to the conclusion that the Earth was extremely old. Although, as we've already touched on in earlier presentations, the exact number that they managed to calculate varied quite significantly. So at the same time as geologists were working on the rocks, 
Those that were focused on biology, particularly uh, Georges Cuvier, demonstrated that many types of plants and animals had died out, so they were coming at it from a biological point of view, and they were making the same observations as the geologists. So uh, the biologists also undertook studies showing that living organisms will change uh, from one species. Uh, sorry, let's try a sentence again, shall we? So they also undertook uh, studies, and they, these studies were showing that uh, living organisms will change, and that change had occurred from one species to another. So what they didn't have, though, was a theoretical framework to allow them to explain these observations. So this brings us on to Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck, and he made a significant contribution to our understanding of the natural world, and he's best remembered for his 1809 work, The Inheritance of Acquired Characteristics. And so the theory he put forward was that new traits arise due to an organism's need. So, for instance, you have a short-necked giraffe, and that short-necked giraffe wants to be able to stretch its neck to reach higher leaves in the trees. And so that's exactly what it does. The giraffe, you know, tries really, really hard, and by doing so, it actually manages to extend its neck to allow it to access these previously inaccessible leaves, which it can now eat. And having made this adaption to itself, it can then pass this adaption onto its offspring. So he is putting forward the idea that animals are changing to suit their environment and their needs. So what he thought, though, was that the characteristics that these organisms acquire during their lifetime were able to be inherited so they can be passed on to the offspring. So at the time, uh, Lamarck's theory was actually logical, and it was pretty sound based on the evidence that was available. So he did, however, note that animals were changing over time, and he provided robust evidence for this, and he put forward a functional, if slightly incorrect, theory to explain it. So this meant that if he was correct, it would mean that creatures could change over time without God's intervention. And so this led to the keeper of shells, which is literally a job, it's someone that takes care of shells, at the British Museum to write, Lamarck and his disciples vomit abominable trash, almost blasphemous and encourage imbecility. Other of my colleagues take a less reasonable view, which for the time is a pretty stinging critique of Lamarck. However, that was one person's view. It wasn't disputed until decades later, when scientists discovered the units of hereditary uh, change, or genes. And we realized uh, that these genes cannot be altered by any common effect on an organism during its lifetime, ignoring radiation. So later on it became realized that uh, the information being passed from the parent to the offspring was within these genes, and these genes can't really change during the life of the parent. And as such, you know, any change must come from, you know, pre-existing uh, genetic material. Anyway, back to Darwin. So, in 1859, Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species. And in the book, he detailed his ideas on evolution, which he had formulated 20 years earlier whilst looking at the finches on the Galapagos Islands. And he also put forward his proposed mechanism for evolution. So, interestingly, he held back his idea for 20 years as he was aware of the uproar that it would cause and the possible damage that this would do to his career and social standing. So, once he actually came back from the voyage, Darwin had gotten married and he had married very, very well. So, he was a, he was a man with some serious money. And so, obviously, this meant he had a you know, good social standing, had a good, you know, good circle of friends, and he didn't really want to do anything that would disturb his you know, pretty comfortable life. And so, instead of you know, putting forward his idea of evolution, he only told a few people, and instead he threw himself into other burning scientific problems of the day, such as the sex life of barnacles. So he also wanted to gather as much supporting evidence as possible because he knew if he was going to do this, he would really have to be able to defend his idea. Then two things went and happened that made him put pen to paper. The first was in 1851 when his 10-year-old daughter Annie went and died of a fever. 
and uh, Darwin later stated that this event chimed the death knell for his Christianity. Then in 1855, he also heard that another scientist called Alfred Russell Wallace, who was working in Asia, had published a paper outlining how the geographical distribution of species could be explained if every new species came into existence near an already existing and closely related species. So you're sitting there thinking, what is he going on about? Essentially what was happening was Alfred Russell Wallace was working in Southeast Asia in an environment that had lots and lots of valleys. And so he noticed that as he went from one valley to the other, each of the valleys had its own individual conditions and the animals that were living in those valleys were distinct from the animals in the adjacent river valleys. But he also so he said, right, the animals are clearly adapting to the local environment in each one of these valleys. But the thing that he noticed was that as he went from one valley to the other, the species he was seeing were very similar. And he noticed that, you know, as you got as you moved along, as you move through the valleys, the species were becoming more and more different. So the further you got away from the, the first valley in which the ancestor species lived, the more evolved or the more different the animals were becoming. So over time, he was suggesting that animals were migrating from one valley to another, and as they migrated each time to a new valley, the species were adapting to that new valley, and they were becoming more and more different from the original ancestor species. And, you know, I think you can agree, this is very, very similar to Darwin's theory of evolution. So Charles Lyell, who was Darwin's friend, spotted the importance of Wallace's work and very quickly pushed Darwin to publish so in 1858, uh, Wallace sent Darwin a 20-page report on his latest theories, which Darwin very quickly realised were very, very similar to, its own, to his own. And interestingly, Darwin offered to support the publication of Wallace's theory in any journal that he supported, although Darwin uh, said that Wallace would have to acknowledge that Darwin had come up with the idea first, but separately. And, you know, this was this was, you know, pretty nice of Darwin. Darwin, if he wanted to, could have been difficult about this and made Wallace's life difficult. And so they came to an agreement. And in 1858, Darwin and Wallace actually published a joint paper together on the theory of natural selection. However, interestingly, the paper itself received remarkably little attention from the scientific community. And there is some suggestion that this may have been by design. There are hints that maybe some of Darwin's friends were helping to, you know, suppress the paper a little bit in order to, you know, make Darwin's book more successful or to make, you know, to prove that Darwin was the first to put forward his idea when he published his book. So On the Origin of Species was published in 1859 and it became a sensation with the general public and it ensured its place in history. Amazingly, the publisher, when he was first given Darwin's manuscript, thought the book was actually extremely dull, and instead he had actually tried to make Darwin write a book about breeding pigeons instead. So, where did Darwin get his supporting evidence from? So, while at the Galapagos Islands, Darwin had realised that species were not immutable and fixed, so change would occur over time. However, he had no idea why this change was occurring. So when he was back in the UK, what he did is he began to observe plant and animal breeders. And he noticed how these breeders would practice artificial selection. So they would find a plant or animal that had some kind of trait that they considered to be desirable. And they would focus on breeding that trait into their plants and animals. So they were selecting these desirable traits. And they would breed together animals with these desirable traits and essentially that would allow them to produce new and distinct varieties. And this, over time, would thereby bring about offspring that had significant differences to the ancestor species. So, you know, if you remember, all dogs are the result of selective breeding from wolves. So the massive range of plants and animals that selective breeding has produced made Darwin wonder. And he thought if a natural process selecting certain variant types, so for instance, the same animal with slight differences, 
in nature, whether, well, would that be able to bring about change? So he's saying if you had lots of, you know, in, if you had the same species, so you have lots of individuals of the same species, but each one of those different individuals has a very, very slight difference about it, well, he's saying that would a natural process kick in that would allow one of those individuals to be more successful than the rest because of its very, very slight adaption? So, of course, the classic example of, uh, of change due to breeding are, of course, dogs. So here are our two uh, starting wolves. So we have the Eurasian wolf here and the North American wolf here. They're slightly different. The Eurasian wolf is pretty much regarded as the, the, the ancestor species for most dogs. But you can see that by breeding for certain traits, you can begin to change the dog itself. So, for instance, we have huskies. You know, very, very similar in design, but they have been bred for other reasons. So huskies, for instance, are absolutely, you know, if you've ever known, if you've ever met, you know, met a husky, you will know they are extraordinarily energetic dogs. So, you know, they, they have lots of energy, they want to move, so they're very, very good at pulling things, for instance. Then you have dogs like Jack Russell Terriers, which are a lot smaller than wolves. You can see they have the same basic design, but notice how the coat is very, 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 you know, close to the body. And this is because these dogs are designed to go down burrows and they're designed to go after things like rabbits and badgers and, you know, other organisms which um, which could be damaging a farmer's crop, for instance. Then you have dogs like Irish wolfhounds, which are clearly bred to be very, very large. And, you know, they're, they're a dog used essentially because they're so imposing and, and uh, they're also used for, you know, hunting and, and defense purposes. And then, of course, you have dogs which are designed, well, bred for, uh, shall we say, uh, less energetic pursuits like uh, the pugs. And you can quite clearly see that this dog isn't really designed for doing too much apart from sitting around and keeping your lap warm. So selective breeding has allowed uh, dog breeders to essentially produce a variety of different dogs simply by focusing on the traits that they desire. And we can see the same thing with plants. So this is wild mustard. And wild mustard is the ancestor species for broccoli, kale, cauliflower, and cabbage. So all of these plants have been, been produced through artificial selection, simply by breeding together uh, different varieties of wild mustard that have different traits, which they consider to be desirable. So Darwin was further influenced by the work of Thomas Multus and his observations that far more animals were born than reached maturity. And so what Darwin realised was that infant mortality would also help to limit population size and affect evolution. And so he came to the conclusion that infant mortality was controlled by competition for the available resources. So that means if a parent has plenty of food, then the offspring were more likely to survive, or, or vice versa. If the parent couldn't get food, then the offspring were more likely to die. So this means that if a parent has a trait that allows them to compete more effectively, then that will allow them to get the best mates, the best nesting sites, the best food, and it means their offspring are more likely to survive and carry that trait forward. This is the process of natural selection. Okay, so this is a good place to stop this presentation, so get up, have a walk around, go and get a drink of water, take a few minutes to relax, and then please come back for part two. <laughs>